All right, hi everyone. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about uh, Silo, which is a system for doing speedy transactions for multi-core in-memory databases. And this is joint work between MIT and Harvard. So what is the goal of this project? So what did we set out to do? So we wanted to build an extremely high throughput in-memory relational database. So that might mean a lot of things to people, so let me be a little bit more clear. So first of all, we wanted to provide fully serializable transactions. So we didn't want to give up any consistency. Second of all, we wanted our database to be durable. So if the database were to crash, we'd want to be able to recover to a, uh, uh, a good state, or a state that we knew was valid. So multi-cores um, seems like a natural fit for this problem, right? Because you have, in, in modern multi-cores now have a lot of chips on them, and they also have a lot of DRAM, so that we can potentially actually run quite a big, large workloads in memory. So yeah. So we set out with these, with these um, hardware, can we go and build a database? So that's exactly what I set out to do. I went and I looked in the database literature, and I also looked at a lot of parallel programming techniques. So I essentially took mass tree, which is a fast non-transactional B tree, and I applied a lot of parallel um, programming techniques to give us a transactional database. And so I run this database that I created, and I get pretty good scalability up to 16 threads. And I go, whoa, cool, I'm done. I'm gonna go graduate now, right? No, not so fast. Well, my advisor goes, hey, you only ran out to 16 threads. What happens if you go up to 32? So I said, okay, fine, let's do that. So I did that, and all of a sudden, it's not as good. Well, that's, that's too bad. So what exactly is going on? So I, I, I ran a profiler in, in this region, and I said, okay, profiler, tell me what's going on. And so it turns out that a lot of time was being spent in the transaction commit protocol, and specifically on one single instruction. And what this instruction was doing, highlighted in the red, is it was reading a global TID or a number that was to generate a global TID and actually giving every transaction a uniquely ordered uh, identifier. And, and, and so looking at this, I said, can we get rid of this? So for instance, maybe we could then generate TIDs that were, for instance, unique, but not globally ordered. Why do we need this ordering property? So it turns out that this is actually pretty useful for recovery, and let me illustrate why. So let's say we have two threads, and they're both logging to separate logs. And the reason we might want to do this is say, uh, we don't want like, the logging system to become the bottleneck of the system, so we're going to put them on separate logs. So let's say we have two transactions, T1 and T2, and they run like this. So T1 is just going to read A and write B, and T2 is just going to blindly write A to 2. And so let's say that T2 comes after T1, and the database commits to these two transactions, and all is good. OK, so what happens if the database were to say crash? So the database crashes, now we need to do recovery. So how do we do recovery? Well, what in particular, we need to ensure that when we do recovery, we, if we were to recover T2, we also recover T1. So we can't just omit T1 on doing recovery. So how do we achieve that property? So if we're doing, for instance, data logging, and we take a look at the logs, we see that, um, you know, for instance, uh, T1's log will contain records B, and T2's log uh, contains record A. So with global TIDs, this is actually pretty easy to ensure we do this correctly, right? Because there's, we know T1 came before T2, so T1 is going to have a number that is less than T2. And so that allows us to then just replay uh, writes in TID order, and all is good. And we can't have this problem. Unfortunately, as I said before, global TIDs are not good for scalability. So the question is, what can we do, and can we do any better? So what if I told you you didn't need global TIDs for recovery? And that's essentially silo. So it's a system we built that gives us near linear scalability on popular database benchmarks. And in, in addition, the raw numbers we get in the system are uh, several factors higher those than those um, seen in uh, the existing, say, our systems in database literature. So how do we do this? What is the secret sauce of our system? So in essence, Silo's secret sauce is a scalable and serializable transaction commit protocol. So what does this mean in particular? So in particular, we are only going to allow shared memory contention to occur when the transactions actually warrant it. So for instance, if I have two transactions that say run, uh, that read and write two disjoint sets of the database, I don't want these two transactions to actually cause shared memory contention. And that's what our protocol is going to ensure. Turns out this was actually surprisingly hard. So giving, letting us preserve scalability while ensuring our system is recoverable is, for instance, much harder than just building a system that is scalable but not recoverable. So how do we do this? So from 1,000 miles above, the way we're going to do this is we're going to use epochs. So we're going to break the time in our system into these units we call epochs. And these, these epochs are going to allow us to avoid doing this serialization right per every transaction. 
So in particular, every transaction we come in the system is going to get a sequence number and an epoch. So the reason we need sequence numbers is that this actually provides us um, with a way of getting serializability during just the execution phase alone. But, as I, but sequence numbers aren't enough. So it turns out that this is actually insufficient for recovery because we, need a, we, we actually need a, 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 a ordering here. So we, in turns, it turns out we need both sequence numbers and epochs to ensure proper recovery. In addition, the way our system is designed, we're going to also need to ensure that we recover entire epochs all or nothing. So let me talk about that in more detail, in particular epochs. So as I said before, epochs take time and we, just, we divide time into them. So in particular, a single thread is going to advance the current epoch. And these are going to form the recovery boundaries of our system. And so the key insight here is with using epochs, we're able to reduce these non-data-driven writes, uh, not caused by the workload, to happening very infrequently or something we can control. Another way of seeing this is that we've turning the serialization point of a commit protocol from a shared memory write, for instance, atomic fetch and add on a, a global TID, to a shared memory read, which turns out to be a read of the current epoch. So let me make a slight digression here and talk about how transaction identifiers work in the system. So every record is going to contain a TID, and in particular, we're going to put in the TID of the last writer. So if you remember before, I said that each transaction is going to be assigned a sequence number and an epoch. In our system, we're going to call that a TID. For, for now, we're going to, that's going to be the TID. So in particular, these three pieces form the TID. It's that sequence number and the epoch. So we're going to assign these TIDs at commit time, and we're going to do it after we do the reads. And the rule we're going to apply is that we're going to take the smallest number in the current epoch that's greater than every TID that we've observed in execution of the transaction. And specifically, this includes looking over all the reads and writes and also the last transaction that this, the, the current thread committed. So that was the setup. How do we execute transactions? So during the pre-commit or the execution phase of a transaction, we're going to proceed uh, as follows. So this is um, we're going we're gonna to proceed and we're going to speculate that the records we read during uh, the transaction are not going to be modified. And then we're going to check at commit time whether or not this was actually true. So if you're familiar with optimistic concurrency control from the database literature, this is uh, very similar to how the pre-commit phase of OCC works. In particular, uh, to do a read, we simply read the TID of the record and save that in a local read set. And then we use that value that we read as the value uh, to, to execute the transaction. And to do a write, instead of modifying the records, we simply buffer them in a local write set. So we leave the records unmodified during the pre-commit phase. And as I said before, this is standard OCC. So here's where we get, here's where it differs from OCC. So we're going to now, we have these read and write sets, and we need to commit this transaction. So how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to, we're going to break our, our commit protocol into several phases. So in the first phase, we're going to acquire locks on every record in our write set. And we're going to do this in a global de uh, deterministic order so we don't deadlock. After we've acquired all these locks, we're going to then take a read of the current epoch. And it's very important that this read happens exactly here, and I will illustrate that why later. But for now, keep in mind that the read happens here. So after we've locked every record, we're going to enter phase two. And phase two is the validation phase. So we're going to validate every record in our read set. And in particular, this means that we must check for two conditions. First of all, we need to check to see if the record that we read, its TID has changed during execution. If its TID has changed, then we know there is a read-write conflict, and we need to abort the transaction. Additionally, we also need to check to see if the lock is held by another transaction. And the reason why is because even though, the, even though the log is held to write hasn't happened, there's a potential write happening in flight, so we mu once again must abort to avoid a potential read-write conflict. OK, so supposing that all the validation of records in the read set has passed, then we can actually go ahead and commit this transaction because we've ensured that there are no read-write conflicts. So we enter phase three. And phase three simply picks a TID by the rule I specified previously and does the writes using this TID. And in particular, the epoch number for this TID is the one that, is the one that we read in the red. So in, in pseudocode form, the protocol looks like this. And in particular in this slide, I want to point out the two memory fences that are surrounding the read of the global epoch. So the reason, like I said before, we, we really require that the global epoch is read here. 
And so we don't want things like the compiler or the memory system on our processor to reorder this load. So to guard against that, we surround it by two memory fences. And, and it turns out in x86, this only has to be a compiler fence, not an actual memory fence. All right, so now we have a commit protocol. How do we return results? So it, let's make this more specific, and let's say that T1 uh, commits in a TID that is in epoch E. So the rule is that we cannot return TID to the client until all transactions in epochs less than or equal to E are on disk. And this rule is because we, when we return uh, a, a transaction to a client, we want to be able to ensure we can recover it. And so by ensuring this, then we will have all the necessary log records on disk to actually recover. All right, now I'm going to try and sketch a correctness argument. So what we want to show is that the epoch read in phase one is the serialization point of this protocol. So one sufficient property, or sorry, one necessary property we need to show is that we need to require that any differences we have in epochs agree with also the, the dependencies of transactions. And there's two cases. So the first case is where T2 reads T1's write. So then T2 depends on T1, and then we require that T2's epoch is greater than or equal to T1's. The second case is when T2 overwrites a key that T1 read. So this is the kind of read, uh, write after read dependency. So T2 depends on T1, and so we have the same requirement on the epochs. And I will now, or I will illustrate why this commit protocol achieves this, but I want to say briefly that the full proof of serializability is in the paper. So let's do the write after read example first. So remember that's T2 overwriting a key that T1 reads. So Let's, pull up, let's say that these two transactions happen. So T1 is that transaction we've seen before where we read A and write B, and T2 is doing that blind write to A. And so because T2 overwrote a key that T1 reads, we know that in time, it essentially looks like this. And in particular, we know that we can draw this happens before arrow between the lock acquisition on T2 and the validation in, uh, in T of A and T1. And we, this is because T2 overwrote T1's read. Uh, if in addition, though, there's two more arrows we can draw. First of all, remember we put a memory fence after the load of the global epoch. So this allows us to ensure that the validation of A happens after the read of the epoch in T1. And similarly, the fence, um, the fence before the read of the global epoch it allows us to argue that the, the lock acquisition of A happens before the read of the global epoch in T2. So we follow these arrows then we can then argue that T2's epoch is greater than or equal to T1's epoch. And the reason why is because um, we know that the read in T1 happens before the read in T2. Very similarly, let's look at a read after write example. So let's say that T2 reads a value that T1 writes. In this case, we slightly modify the transaction to be less this. So T1 is now doing the blind write, and T2 is going to do a read modify write, so increment 1 to A, on A itself. So because T2 reads T1's write, we know, we know that the ordering looks somewhat like this. And we can follow the same logic as before to essentially argue that T2's epoch is greater than or equal to T1's epoch. Well, that's nice, but there's an additional stronger thing that we can actually argue in this particular example, or in, in, in the case of read after write. If we think about how TIDs are generated, and we remember that um, T1 is going to actually write the TID of it, it put in record A, and that T2, remember the rule, is actually going to see this number and a, put a number greater than this number. So then by following this chain of uh, happens before relationships, we can then argue actually that T2's TID is greater than T1's TID. And why is this important? Because now within a single epoch during recovery, we can properly replay writes to the same key. So now I've described the protocol. I want to tell you how we actually store data in silo. So this is switching gears a bit. So we have this commit protocol, but we need a data structure to give us access to records. So we use Mastery, which is a fast non-transactional B tree for multi-cores. Uh, but the way I've described this protocol is pretty agnostic to the data structure we actually use. So for instance, we could use like a hash table. But we use a, we use a, a B tree so we can get these nice range scans. And in particular, Mastery in silo looks like this. So remember, we're building a relational database here. So every table contains a primary key and possibly zero or more secondary indexes. And we give a mastery to each of these indexes. In addition, uh, we use, uh, so mastery uses a lot of parallel programming techniques and also other systems elsewhere. And we adapt a lot of these, uh, these techniques. 
So for instance, we use read, read copy update to avoid reference counting, version number validation to give us cheap reads, and the software prefetching of cache lines to essentially give us bashing of remote DRAM latencies. So I've described mastery, I've described this commit protocol, but there's kind of a gap between what I've described and in, in, in the system we built, and in, in particular a, a database. So there's all these things that we actually have to handle to be able to run real workloads. So for instance, we actually have to put keys in the system, right? So in, in addition, there's like range scans and garbage collection, all this other stuff. So, so there's, there's, there's all this stuff and additionally the dependencies amongst them. So these are kind of these details that are, you know, they're fun and you should see the paper for more of them because they're kind of cool. So now I'm gonna talk about how Silo actually performs on workloads. So to set this up, we use this 32 core machine that has uh, the following characteristics. So there's pretty, uh, pretty recent chips, pretty uh, reasonable amount of RAM, and a, a beefy IO subsystem. So in particular, there's three Fusion IO drives and a, and a, a large RAID 5 array of disks. And um, it's running a, r a relatively recent version of Linux. And for the time being, there's no network clients. So the workloads that we evaluate are, are these two. So first of all is TPCC. This is an online retail store benchmark. And the point of TPCC is that it has very large transactions. So for instance, there's a transaction called delivery in TPCC that does about 100 reads and 100 writes. So the average log record length turns out to be about a kilobyte in our system. So if you kind of take the throughput of our system and multiply it together, we end up getting about a gigabyte a second of log records being generated. So remember why we have a beefy IO subsystem is because we don't want, for instance, the throughput of the, the log record generation to bottleneck on the hardware itself. So that's the first benchmark. And the second benchmark is a YCSB-like benchmark. So YCSB is Yahoo's popular key value workload. And so we run, we run it for the purpose of actually running small transactions. So we wanted to see what's the overhead on these small transactional workloads. So silo on TPCC looks like this. So we ran this experiment and we asked, is it linearly scalable? And so we get this curve that looks like this. So silo is this, uh, the solid blue line. And for the most part, it is pretty scalable, except for when we get to about 28 threads. And the question is why? So our hypothesis was that at that point, because the TPCC transactions were so large, we were essentially bottlenecked on our hardware. To validate this hypothesis, we run essentially what is the dash line, which is where we took silo and we put the log records not on the durable disk, but in an in-memory uh, file system, tempfs. And by doing that, we saw that we were able to get pretty linear scalability. So from that, we concluded that um, the I/O in a system in our uh, the I/O system that we currently have is slightly limiting to scalability, but the transaction commit protocol does not, and that's we believe is very important. So an additional note here is that the numbers I present here for TPCC are not only several times faster than a commercial system we ran our same hardware, but they're also better than those in the paper. So we have since made improvements since the camera ready. It's exciting. All right, so. Switching gears a bit, so I showed you what SIO looks like on large workloads or large transactional workloads. What is, what is the overhead on small transactional workloads? So remember our YCSB workload. So we run an experiment and uh, we scale it up and we see it looks like this. So the first line here is this uh, key value or this dashed line here, or this, sorry, this uh, gray line. And what, what we did there is we took the commit protocol just stripped it outside of SILO and that essentially gives us mastery. So remember there's no multi-key transactions here. So the overhead of this protocol ended up being about 4%, which is pretty good. That means that transactional commits are pretty inexpensive. However, that's not the same. So, so we did this, but remember I spent a lot of this time talking about this global TID and avoiding this global TID, and we put a lot of work into it. So the question is, does that actually matter? So we took this silo, version of silo and we stuck in a single compare and swap in the commit protocol on a single shared memory word or single shared memory cache line and we ran the protocol and we saw now that all of a sudden, we, this is the scalability collapse at around uh, 20 threads. And it actually accounts for roughly, say, 45%. So it turns out that yes, all this work we did to remove a single instruction actually matters. So related work, so we're definitely not the first people to explore multi-core databases. Uh, and in particular, there's many systems, or there's some systems that uh, have come before ours. So uh, there's Hackathon, which is Microsoft's recent system, uh, ShoreMT, which is another database system, and, my, and, and also recently people have done some uh, lock-free data structure work in MySQL itself. 
But in all these systems that we've studied or we looked at, we saw that there were still some global critical sections in their protocols. So for instance, it might be even just a single you know, global TID generation. But the point is, and the point of silo is we were, try we were trying to show that this still limits multi-core scalability. A somewhat complementary or somewhat different approach to shared database approaches is looking at uh, partition databases. So this manifests itself in HDOR and VaultDB and other uh, systems in the database literature. The problem with partitioning the database is that load balancing now becomes tricky, right? So we have a partition, we have to decide what the partition is, and once we decide the part what the partition, if all of a sudden the workload becomes skew, now we have to shuffle data around and things become more complicated. And so we've run a lot of experiments comparing silo to a, a partition store which we built, and for the, those detailed experiments, I defer you to the paper. So to conclude, Silo is a new system that we built to uh, give us high throughput transactions on modern multi-cores. And the key technique or the key contribution in Silo was a scalable and serializable commit protocol. Uh, we've shown great uh, performance on popular benchmarks and you can grab our code on GitHub here at this URL. So thank you and now uh, I open for questions. I'll start with one from the moderator. Um, in your TPCC, you only have one thread per warehouse, which means your workload has almost zero contention. Moreover, there's no network communication. These assumptions are not likely in the real world, so is this evaluation comparable to formal papers? Okay, uh, that's a good question. So, uh, first of all, one thread per warehouse doesn't actually mean zero contention. So the way that TPCC is organized, um, you have a bunch of these transactions that are essentially running within a warehouse, but you know, about 10% of them are actually talking to other warehouses. So the workload does actually have contention in it. Now you're right that with network clients, this is uh, not entirely an apples to apples comparison with other um, systems, which is why we didn't exactly like say plot the numbers and call them out very explicitly. Uh, the point is though, however, we don't think that network overhead itself is um, potentially that much of an issue. So it's obviously going to cause um, a bottleneck, or it's, sorry, it's obviously gonna cause some uh, performance uh, overhead, so it's not going to be for free. But for instance, the mastery paper was able to show that even doing full network transactions, it only was about 23% overhead. So if we kind of carry those numbers over, uh, we, we hope to see something similar. And networking is something we've been wanting to do, but you know, there's, I guess, finite time. So, sorry, is, that, is, is there another question on that? Okay. Uh, Yulian Moraru, Carnegie Mellon. Um, so epochs seem seem to cause you to have very high latency yeah. in the uh, tens of uh, milliseconds. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't wouldn't you be able to avoid epochs by uh, explicitly tracking dependencies between transactions through per object versions? Yeah. So I guess the initial design of our um, commit or initial design of our commit protocol or the, the the logging stuff actually did do like we were trying to track versions explicitly. Uh, this turned out to be kind of expensive. There's like a lot of stuff you have to write to, to track version um, numbers correctly. And we've made it right now so our log records essentially only pretty much contain the updates. And that's already pretty expensive. You saw that that was kind of like a bottle, uh, you know, starting to limit the scalability system. So by adding more information, I feel like that would just hurt the system more. And that's why we went to an epoch-based solution. But you're definitely right that the latency of the system is now governed by that epoch number. And so in the paper, we set that to, to be roughly on the order of tens of, uh, tens of milliseconds. But um, it is interesting, like, you know, I, I will run more experiments to actually vary this number and see how it affects scalability. Um, I'll do another from the moderator. Um, have you compared with using a scalable counter for allocating TIDs rather than using a basic atomic fetch and add? For instance, threads on nearby calls could batch together their requests for IDs and perform a single atomic fetch and add? Um, I mean, that's a good question. It's not something considered. Um, I mean, that's not something I've actually run the experiment for. So I guess I, I worry that might complicate the protocol design, but um, that's like something we will think about. Yeah. Have you explored using something like timestamp counters for global TIDs? Uh, timestamp, yeah. So I. Right, so we've thought about like, is there some sort of like vector clock version of the protocol? I think, um, right, I'm trying to think why we, so, okay, so why do we not, essentially it's a question like, why do we not use some sort of like vector clock-like thing or 
Right, so I mean, that's uh, the problem there is now that, like, if you have a vector clock, the TID is now, like, of the length of the number of cores you have, right? So this is, we, we now have a single number, and we would end up turning that into potentially a vector that was kind of long. And so because these log records are being written really fast, we want this, like, number to be, you know, one word and not, like, 20 words. So, like, that's why we want to just have a one single number to be very concisely described, like, the TIDs. I mean, the hardware timestamp counters. Hardware time. Oh, no, that's a, I mean, no, we haven't actually looked at that. I mean, that's actually something we've been thinking about. How do we exploit the, like, ordered uh, RTDSC or something? Yeah, that's a good question. So that's something we would probably look at in the future. I'm sorry. Yeah, I just asked the TPC uh, question, and uh, I'm not very satisfied by your answer because I agree that there are 10% of uh, all the lines goes to other warehouses. Mm -hmm. But these 10% of all the lines are distributed to all the items. Mm -hmm. The contention only happens if, uh, for example, uh, one thread is uh, ordering this item and another thread in another warehouse goes to this warehouse and order the same item. Mm -hmm. So the contention is not 10%, it's 10% divided by the number of items, which is still a very small number. And moreover, because there's no network, so you can issue requests very fast, and that's why you can use only single thread. Mm -hmm. If there's really network communication between client and thread, you cannot only serve one warehouse with only one thread because the thread will wait there. Right, so I mean, I think we're assuming that any sort of network implementation is, I mean, it has to, yes, you're right, it has to do some form of batching, right? So we assume there's probably some sort of middleware that's gonna aggregate a bunch of requests and then we can run them in a single thread. Like, if you were to, you know, I, I think you're right in the sense that if every single client had a single TP, uh, sorry, a TCP connection, then yeah, the, oh, this is probably not realistic, but some form of middleware would be employed to kind of get around this problem. As for the TBCC stuff, um, so yes, the reason why we chose the TBCC, like, so you want the workload to have some contention but not be fully limited by, like, if we ran a workload that every single thread was, like, writing, for instance, the same warehouse, like, the same item in the same warehouse, then you're right, we wouldn't expect to see linear scalability, but that's a property of the workload. So we particularly chose a workload that had a, some form of contention so there's still some aborting, but could actually, we could actually expect to see linear scalability on, right? So we want to start with a workload where this was actually possible. And so that's why we like didn't choose, for instance, like, you know, one, uh, say like everyone's writing to the same warehouse. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks.